out, we have this amazing panel on performance. So I'm going to introduce Sam, who's the moderator. Sam Saffron is a co-founder of Discourse, creator of the Mini Profiler, Memory Profiler, Mini Meme, and Mini Racer Gems. He's written extensively about various performance topics on samsaffron.com. And Sam loves making sure Discourse keeps running fast. Enjoy. Um, hey, is everybody still awake? Woo! Yeah. Ah, cool. Um, okay, I'm just going to have the panel introduce themselves, and then um, my I've got a, a bunch of questions prepared, but also we're accepting questions, and there's a little chat thingy, so you can just log in and type your question, and I'll triage it while stuff is going on. And if anything really interesting pops up or uninteresting pops up, I'll... Or if it crashes, then <laughs> it's back to traditional. Well, anyway, let's start. Um. Uh, my name is Nate Bergepeck. Uh, I'm a independent performance consultant. I work on people's Rails apps to make them faster, um, and I blog about it um, online at uh, speedshop.co. I am Rafael Fresa. I work at Shopify as a production engineer. My job there is to make sure that Shopify runs smoothly in our production systems. And I also a member of the Rails Cloud team. All right. uh, hi, I'm Eileen Uchitel. I work at GitHub. My job is sometimes performance, but not always. But I've given a few talks on performance, on uh, speeding up integration tests, and other stuff in Rails. And I'm also on the Rails core team with Raphael. Hey everybody, my name is Richard Schneeman. I go by Schneems on the internet. I work for a uh, startup in San Francisco called Heroku. Um, they're kind of up and coming. Um, <laughs> some of you might have experienced some issues with them in the last uh, couple of minutes here. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, I, uh, I do performance work. Um, like when customers come um, with an, an issue, then it's like, okay, well, how can we make this a little bit faster? And I'll take a look at their apps. Uh, I wrote, um, Derailed benchmarks, I don't know if any of you all have used that one, um, as well as uh, I, I blog. I'm, I'm on the blogosphere, so yeah, that's me. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I think we should, I'd like to get started talking a bit about how to get involved in this whole performance thing. So I guess the question to the panel is, you know, if I haven't done anything publicly before and I haven't done any performance work, where, where do I start? Um, we'll we're going to do this like down the line every time. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I get, we can I'm in the pole position. It. What? You want to arm wrestle for it? Uh, yeah. We can Here flip. we go. All right. I lose. Oh, no. Go. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just talked, though, like two seconds ago. So you got to. Uh, so, I mean, I got started in performance work because I used to work at an e-commerce company. Um, and uh, it was clear to me then um, and it's still clear to me now that fast sites are sites that make money um, and uh, sites that people enjoy using. Uh, so I've kind of always had that very like customer focused approach of like, you know, the, the speed of the website is a primary, primary component of how your users or your customers um, interact with it. Um, so I mean, I, I got interested in it for that reason because I wanted people to buy more stuff on this website. <laughs> Um, and, you know, it's, it, once you start digging into it, it just, like, became, like, it's not often in programming that you can get, like, these very discrete problems, which, when you fix them, it's like, oh, I made this 10 a 1. That's really good, right? Like, it used to take 10 seconds, now it takes 1 second. Like, that is better. You know, like, it, maybe that's just, like, the one route that someone hits, like, once every blue moon. But like it's faster for that dude now, so that's cool. Uh, so that concrete impact of like performance work became very addicting to me. And then you know you just keep doing it and keep doing more of it, I guess. And you just sort of start picking up the skills, I guess. So um, so I mentioned I work for Heroku. Uh, one of the things that I do is when uh, a ticket comes in for Ruby, someone is using Ruby and it can't be handled by our, um, our 
support staffing. It'll, it'll get escalated and it'll end up on, on my desk. And um, people occasionally will say, hey, I'm using Heroku and like I'm not getting the performance I want. And um, generally whenever, I consider, I consider performance issues a bug. And like generally when somebody is hitting a bug of any kind on Heroku, they're like, oh, Heroku is breaking all of my stuff. Well, so first of all, 99% of the time, unless it's like right this very moment, that's not true. <laughs> um, and so instead, so I, I mean, I do spend a good amount of time helping customers get to the right solution, but also a good amount of my job is also proving essentially that it's not, <laughs> that it's, it's, you know, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> uh, and um, so that's, that's actually what inspired uh, uh, derailed benchmarks is um, I was was getting a couple of performance issues that I just could not um, could not debug on Heroku and um, this was before we had so we have uh, something called PS exec right now where you can actually SSH into a dyno and um, get you know some extra metrics and stuff that way but uh, before we could do that the only way to debug a, a performance issue was to reproduce it and reproduce it locally which also happens to give um, the, the benefit of now I can say, oh, the performance issue also happens locally. <laughs> like, not my issue. <laughs> um, but no, and, and then I got into this great uh, community, met a bunch of other people uh, who care about performance, and it's just like, even, even today, people will come to me and say, hey, this, I'm experiencing this behavior on my app. Like, why is it happening like this? And I was like, I don't know. That's a really, like, you know, that's like telling Sherlock Holmes uh, somebody I don't know, stole a cookie out of the cookie jar, and um, you know, it's just like I, I have to dig in and and, and get deeper. Um, yeah. Is this is this something like only advanced developers can do? I'll just uh, move uh, to Eileen. Oh, I didn't get this, the answer. This like because I remember you got you, you got <laughs> started like a lot with the performance work. Just uh, you picked the um, mini profiler gem back in the day, and you worked on this giant commit. So, so how does it like? How, how do you? What, what made you decide to just, I guess, get started with this and like, get out there and do this kind of work? Well, the first time I got involved with performance was because I crashed a staging database. Uh, I was trying to insert like a ton of data for the sales team to use for like, their demos, and I didn't really know. I just knew I was like, oh well, Active Record knows how to do it. <laughs> I'll just shoved data into the database, and then uh, I used so much memory that it crashed the MySQL instance of the staging database. So I had to like figure out, well, why like, why is it slow? Like, is it RHEL's fault? Is it my fault? Is it MySQL's fault? And I used that to figure out ways to insert or, or update or delete data better so that we didn't have a whole memory bloat problem. So for like the insert records, I used the like, direct MySQL batch insert versus when I was deleting stuff, I used delete all instead of destroy all because I just needed to like blow the database away. Uh, that led to my first talk on Active Record, which is all about really how Active Record is not, it's not, it's not Active Record's fault because it can't be like, oh, by the way, you should use this instead and I'm gonna just do it for you because then your callbacks aren't run and like other things happen to your life that make you sad that are not just performance. So you don't, you know, you don't want Active Record to take over for you. And then like because of that, I started getting involved in open source stuff and, well, I, your, the mini test, or not mini test, um, mini, mini profiler. profiler, just, there was like this big problem, and it wasn't like a problem, but it was, uh, there was I don't even remember what I, what I worked on, it was just something that you were like, I need help. <laughs> and it was like the one open source project that said, I need help across the top of it, like in big bold letters. And I was like, cool, this guy's desperate enough to let me touch <laughs> his code base. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Rafael? Uh. So I first started with performance work as I was working as a consultant in Brazil. And one of my, um, one of the things that my job required me to do was to work on other people's problems. And usually all the clients that we had had major performance problems because of any reasons, like sometimes it was database, sometimes it was front-end performance, and nobody in my team wanted to work on those problems, so I kind of felt my plate, and I enjoy it because, like Nate said, it's the kind of problem that you actually see the value 
being delivered to the users right away because you can see that in your machine too. So that was when I started. I can say that I did not have any kind of contact with this kind of work before doing that, so I had to learn all this new world for me, a lot of different tools, and yeah, I, I don't think that you need to be an experienced developer to work with performance, which you can just know how the system works, like let's say that you're working on Ruby application, that if you know Ruby well enough to write an application on Ruby, it's possible to you to also know how to do performance work on a Ruby application. Yeah, I just I just wanted to add that like as far as experienced developer, like I, I don't think you have to be an experienced developer to do performance work, but I do think you have to be curious because performance yeah. work can can involve so many different areas of the stack, most of which you probably have no experience with. <laughs> um, you know, if, if a if a web request takes five seconds, right? If that's all the information that we have. Uh, there's literally like 20 layers, <laughs> right, that, that are involved in that five seconds. It's like the network, uh, the application server, the, your application code, uh, the Ruby VM, the um, kernel, like there's, 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 and there's so many shades in between of all those different layers, right? So like I found that this work has made my knowledge pool like much, I have like a very wide and shallow knowledge pool now because when you're doing performance work, the requirement is known. You know, it's this this thing is slow and I have to make it faster. But oftentimes it's like that solution could be anywhere. So you just have to be curious and you just have to not be intimidated, I think. Awesome. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so uh, one, one uh, just generic piece of advice um, that I've uh, really taken to, which when somebody asks me like, oh, how do I do thing this thing? Um, well, there's a term, uh, there's a saying that says, um, writers write. If you want to be a writer, you should go write. Like, how do I become a writer? Well, I write. Um, if I want to do performance work, well, you need to do performance work. Um, and just like being generally interested in it, uh, if you don't know where to start, like you can see what other people are doing or other people are talking about, um, like what tools exist out there. Uh, like I, um, I got my, my, even my first what things could possibly even be optimized, um, like I got from like adequate record from a, a keynote and it was like, oh, hey, there's this thing called like memory allocation when you like create a new object. And like if you do that a bunch, like that's like bad. And there's cases where, where like at the library level, maybe we can optimize that a little bit. Um, and that doesn't have to be the case for everyone. But like I, I also went to Nate had a front end uh, workshop and it was like here are discrete examples of you know, here's a problem, and then here's a here's a series of potential solutions, um, and it, it's just kind of a, a iterative process of doing the same things like over and over and over, and like like he said, e exploring and, and going deeper. Cool. Um, the chat room's actually all alive and full of questions, so I can go off my uh, question list to the chat questions. Um, one question that I'd like to actually talk about here is, is tuning the Ruby GC still needed in 2x? I remember 1.9x defaults did not work well with Rails, a question by Tony. And I'll, I'll start answering it um, in kind of a non-obvious answer is that if that's the wrong question to be asking because what you should be doing is measuring. And if you are measuring and you have some sort of graph that you're trying to make the line go down and you twiddle with something and the line goes down, then you know that there's success. But if I tell you, yeah, you need to edit this kind of GC setting and you go and edit it and it actually does damage um, to your performance and you don't know, then you're in a very serious situation. Uh, at Discourse, we do edit some GC settings, but the ones that we do edit are all based on feedback that we got from graphs that actually showed that changing that setting helped. Do you regret publishing that blog post that listed all those GC settings that you use? Because I think, I, I, I wish I knew the amount of people that have just copy pasted those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, do I regret? I don't know. No, I don't regret. Information is good. <laughs> I, I, I don't regret information being out there, I guess. 
you brought up something very important about performance that I think a lot of, like for, when you first see a performance problem, like your first reaction is, I want to fix this, but you can't fix anything with performance until you measure it. Just like you can't fix a bug without actually knowing what's causing the bug, you can't just like, you could just shove a rescue in your controller and you're like, sweet, I fixed the bug, but you didn't really. <laughs> Like, oh yes, it doesn't throw an error anymore, but it's still there. Um, and so that's the biggest thing with performance is making sure that you have a measurement before and after you fix something, because otherwise you don't know you actually fixed it. And there was an incident, there was one time Aaron Patterson and I were trying to fix a performance issue, and we luckily were measuring because the uh, profiler said it was fixed, but the benchmarks said it wasn't. And so if we had just gone with the profiler, like speed, that, that number is no longer high after we benchmarked it and figured out it was still the same speed and slow. So that's why you have to measure before and after, or else you don't know you actually changed anything for the better. Any other GC setting recommendations? Uh, yeah. So so on, well, on, what was that conversation we had earlier about, oh, I think the three of us, you were talking about, uh, we were talking about setting GC, the max yeah. slot growth limit? Uh, yeah, so there's a, I think it's like um, GC growth. It, it's got the words growth and factor in it. Um, all, yeah. So it, A, it pays to know what changing one of those settings is actually doing. Like, uh, you don't want to just like. Uh, this is a blog post that's been sitting in my queue for a while. I want to go through each GC tuning variable and explain exactly what it does. Yeah. Oh, the, the important one, the, the, one of the important ones that we're talking about is so uh, each. Uh, Ruby object gets a slot um, in the Ruby VM. Um, this is it's, it's an R value C structure, um, and uh, the there's three variables I think which control this how this slot this, these slots grow. Uh, one is a, a factor. So each time we run out of slots, we multiply the amount of slots we have by this factor, and that's the new amount of slots that we have. Uh, then there's two very two other variables which can put a max and a minimum on that number. Um, so if by default we realize it was 1.8, I thought it was less than that. Um, so and if I have a thousand heap slots and I decide I need more, I will grow the heap to 1,800. And the problem is, is that most people's applications have a million heap slots um, when they're in a, a steady state, you know, after running for six hours or whatever. And then you run out of slots at some point. Major GC happens, and now you have 1.8 million slots, which is probably 800,000 more than you actually needed. What you really needed was another 100,000 slots. Um, so setting those uh, can sometimes uh, reduce the amount of free slots um, that are in the Ruby VM. Uh, you would know that this is a problem if in, for example, if you have New Relic, um, New Relic's Ruby VM tab will show you how many used and free slots um, you have at any given time. And if you have these huge numbers of free slots, it's the yellow uh, part of the graph on New Relic, then maybe you have a problem with this setting. And you can also, um, a lot of these things you want to, like, you don't want to just start optimizing GC until you, you've, yeah, you've benchmarked and you say, okay, yes, this is the thing, this is the thing I'm having problems with. Um, you could maybe tell if you have this problem if you look at your, me your memory graph and it's, you know, it's kind of going up and going up and then just all of a sudden you see this giant wall of, of memory and you're just like, okay, well, you know, what, after your server's been running for like whatever, six hours or something um, and, changing, and changing this value, changing this growth factor will help with that. Um, I've got a recommendation and the actual name of the growth factor, the actual name of the GC setting um, on an article on the Dev Center for Heroku under, um, if you like search go uh, memory use Heroku, I think it's R, R14 maybe. I have a little section on that with a recommendation. I think it's like 1.01, .01, so it grows by like 1% instead of like 80%. So yeah, I mean, if you're looking for specifics, um, uh, Discourse is actually um, open source and anybody can download it and install it. And we have an official Docker image that controls the whole installation. So you can just look at the source there and see what we're using. And it's pretty well documented why I change whatever GC settings I change. Um, so there's only one really that I play with, which is capping the growth um, at, uh, instead of it growing exponentially, making it just grow by 100,000 uh, 100, slots at a time. Um, there are more questions here. 
Um, what does great performance mean to you? Is high RPS, fantastic CPU resource utilization, sub 100 millisecond requests by Danny. What is fantastic performance for you? Um, I guess, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is fantastic. Um, it, it's, uh, when, I, when I think about performance, I think about the end result. So a lot of times we like to think that you know, the server says that it's able to render stuff, uh, to generate stuff in 100 milliseconds. Everything is good and, like, we can go home now because our work is done when, in fact, like, we have all of these little JavaScript snippets that we've collected from all these places and we put that we didn't think about client performance at all. And every user that goes to our site actually experiences a five-second delay because we didn't think about a CDN. We didn't think about deferring our JavaScript. We didn't think about minifying our JavaScript, possibly, and so on. So for me, like, yeah, I mean, there's this 100 millisecond thing that, you know, Amazon strive for, but there's also, you know, uh, when, when I think about performance, I don't just look at the server side. Um. Uh, when I think of great performance, I think of um, Wes Anderson movies. That is good. Yeah, yeah. Those, are, those are good. Um, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, people. Um, thank you, Evan. Thank you. Uh, low. So I I'm mostly focused on the server side of things, and and I consider good um, low request variance. And so what that means is that um, it's it, even if your average is like, oh, we're serving requests in like 10 milliseconds, mm -hmm. but one out of every like you know that means maybe most of your requests are like one millisecond, and then one is like. 10 seconds or 20 seconds or 30 seconds, like that's really high request variance. And, um, and that, that ends up having uh, a lot of impact. I mean, yes, that one person has to wait for that 10 second thing, but if you can also get this like, this um, queuing effect where slow requests will end up behind that, or fast requests will end up behind that slow request and then it'll feel a lot slower um, and like a lot of these things like tuning, you know, GC or like, you know, modifying your server settings or something like, it kind of doesn't matter if, if your end code is just slow. Um, and so like my big, my approach uh, when I end up with, when I'm working on an app that is slow is I want to know the slowest endpoints and that's where I start. Um, I mean, the slowest endpoints that have a lot of traffic. Uh, and then getting, getting those down and generally you not only do those become faster, it actually speeds up the, a little bit of the rest of your server as, as well. Yeah, it's just like queuing theory 101 that it's way easier to load balance something where the response, the, the time in the system uh, is has low variance than something that has high variance. God, now there are jokes in the chat room as well, so I need to filter them out. Um. <laughs> uh, no, there was, a, there was a good question here. Uh, Laura said, do you ever find yourself preemptively over-optimizing your code for performance before there is need to consider it? Yes. <laughs> and, well, it's like performance, I think this is kind of why sometimes measurement will go by the wayside is that, or in properly like benchmarking and profiling is like, I think, I don't know if you guys feel like this, but like the the solutions are like such like candy to me. Like getting to implement, you know, the, the latest like little trick or whatever. Like I love that. So like, yeah, sometimes I'll just do things to do it, and and whether or not I really needed to. Um, so, you know, as long as it, you're not actually spending that much time doing it, it's not really that big a deal. But when you get like, you know. Uh, 24 hours deep on a yak shave to like, you know, make whatever the new thing, cool, hot new thing was, work with your app, it's like that was a waste of time. You good? You good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, oh, you, just, you just kept going. Oh. You kept going, and I was like, oh, Sorry? I think you're done. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, yeah. Timeout, request expired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I figured it out, okay. so. When you start learning like things that you can improve for, like for in your app performance wise, there's you're gonna have the urge to just do that every single time because you're like, oh, I know it's faster. But if you're doing that, push that upstream to Rails, 
or to a gem or to Ruby, because if you're doing it over and over again, chances are someone else is doing it over and over and over again too. And so then everyone can benefit from it when you push it upstream to Rails or whatever. You, you know, if you do something, we had a, someone change find in batches recently on Rails something, you could add, what was it, limits or? Yeah. Yeah, and so like now, you know, maybe somebody was doing that in their app a lot, so now everyone can use it because it's in Rails. So Thank you, Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you said push it up. So I guess this is for Rafael. So, like there are what a thousand open PRs for Rail Five, and like how do <laughs> I how do I manage That's to get problem, right? <laughs> my PR now into Rails Five Two and my performance fix into there? What what can I do to make it more um, likely that the change that I submitted? will be reviewed by the team and actually merged in? What, what steps can I take? I think the, the first thing that you need to do is actually sh prove that there is a problem in the framework. So if you are measuring your application and you put that data in the issue or the pull request description, it's very likely to you to have this PR merged because we know that someone is having that problem. Because what we try to avoid in Rails is premature optimizations, like there were a bunch of PRs, frozen strings everywhere in the framework, but we don't want that. Like we only want to solve real problems, not to change all the code base to be slightly faster, but not really. So, so you're saying if I overall like cut down on 10 allocations in a rare case, then it's less likely to be accepted for me than me cutting down 50,000 allocations in the general like high performance yeah, exactly. case. And that is what you're looking for. Yeah. And, and I'll also say different patches are, um, ev every single pull request has an overhead. Even if you're just adding dot freeze to like a string on one line, well, now suddenly, if I'm blaming, doing git blame, then that you know that might mess up that. Um, it's you know it requires the overhead from from us. Um, I've done I've done a bunch of Rails performance stuff in the past. A lot of those freezes are my fault. I'm sorry. Um, but when I did it, I submitted. I said here's uh, here's the benchmarks. Here's how to reproduce. Here's the steps I took. Like and not not only that. Um, like not only does that keep me honest. It also gives other people eyes and uh, to, to, to look at it. And then previously I said, if you're interested in doing performance stuff, then find other people doing performance stuff. And hopefully if, if you hear, oh, somebody so-and-so, like yesterday, there's a like, camel got three, three times faster, right? That's a, that's a thing. Yay, Woo! Thank you. Um, and and uh, the first thing I did was uh, was be like, okay, well, how? I, me I messaged him that and misspelled it horribly, and then like a bunch of people saved it. Um, <laughs> and uh, and but it, in your pull request, if you have here's my benchmarks, um, then you you can go and try and and do that. Um, I act, uh, and like I've actually had a case where. Um, people have done that and not gotten the same results, and then and actually it it, it turns out that um, you know the they they didn't push the the fix or whatever, and it's like oh that was actually really helpful to know that not everybody got the same thing, um, so yeah, benchmarks. Cool. Uh, I have a correction from Smiley Face Huggy Face Koala saying there are only 700 issues in Rails that are open now. So. <laughs> I'm just apologizing, only <laughs> seven. Anyway, um, okay, there's a question by Nikos. Should you refactor before trying to optimize a code path about like the tension between fast code and pretty code? So where do you, where does the panel see themselves in this, uh, I guess, continuum? Uh, I'll start. Uh, Fast code versus, that's, that's actually like two separate questions. I think in general you just, uh, you know, I've, every time I touch something I try to make it better. So if I'm touching it for a performance reason, I'm also gonna try to rewrite it to make it, you know, more readable or whatever. Like we just, we literally just had a thing on Puma where we have an issue where um, uh, Puma processes are accepting too many um, requests um, and the like, 
conditional and the code that was like causing this behavior was like really confusing. Um, and we actually like reading through it with Evan, we were like, uh, what is this until less than, and like couldn't even like process it all at once. So we re rewrote it at the same time. Like the actual change was like just removing an unless from one line, but then we rewrote the conditionals. We actually understood what the change was doing. So um, I don't think there's any tension there. I think you're, you're, you're kind of getting at like, uh, I mean, the, we don't really do this in Ruby, but like when people like inline stuff, you would like in uh, you would like unroll for loops or whatever. Like we don't really do that kind of stuff. I don't. Do you feel? Does anyone feel like we so have a tension between? Kind kind of. So like uh, on, on the other on the other question, which was um, oh, I don't even remember it, but it's the one that you just said no about. What was that question? The tension between pretty code and fast code. Uh, so um, like knowing a bunch of performance tips like a bunch of micro performance optimization sometimes that micro performance optimization is not as pretty as what you would normally do in in ruby um like uh you know um recently there was a thing on like don't use case statements um there's like a blog post like stop using case statements very large grandiose you know thing and it's like coming from a like performance work it's like a uh, case statements are actually optimized by the um, by like the the Ruby VM in some cases, and like yes, it might actually be harder to work with and not as pretty. But um, there there might be case there might be s some times when you just want to make that thing faster, um, or or it's like oh I can move move this object allocation outside of the loop, but it's you know it's not as like it's not as nice, it's not as pretty, and so I mean I I I get that. Um, but I, I tend to only optimize for one thing at a time. Ideally, I want, it to, uh, I want it to be correct, and then I want it to be pretty, and then I want it to be fast. Like that's kind of like make it correct, make it you know, good to work with, uh, and, then, and then make it fast. And generally when I do it in that order, I'm fairly happy with the, the end results. I think, I think freeze is a good example of this because adding freeze everywhere makes your code ugly, but then it sometimes makes it faster. So it's usually like you have to, and that's why you have to measure, is the performance impact so much better? You know, if, if a method in Rails is called only once, like ever on boot, there's no point in freezing it because it's not gonna actually, it's not like called multiple, multiple times to build up your allocations. So you don't necessarily need that in the same way if you're like calling it all the time and you wanna keep your allocations down. Um, another question. What might you do to tackle a major performance degradation from a framework library language upgrade that you only find with live traffic? And actually, uh, Rafael has been going through a big upgrade at um, <laughs> Shopify. And like, yeah, how, do you, how do you tackle any performance regressions that you get from a major upgrade? So just so give it, let, let it clear, like the Rails team want to know those regressions. So the first thing you have to do is like open an issue, please. We want to fix that as soon as, as possible. Because what we want to avoid is like this kind of regressions. And the only way that we have right now to know that is when people get with live traffic. We have some some projects like the Hub Benchmarks website so that runs the Rails some Rails benchmarks to see if you had regressions or not, but that don't get all the cases that's happening. So if you find a major regressions, please report to the framework so we can work together to fix those regressions. I, so I discussed those, a lot of those reports. Like I remember when we released Rails 2, he did a bunch of reports saying that we were allocating more objects or some code path was slower than before and we fix all of them. Yeah, definitely. I agree, reporting. Reporting is the key. But like how did you pick up how do you pick up that you've got a problem? Uh, for example, like you've just upgraded it. Did you know before? Did you measure everything before? Or did you deploy and then look yeah, at monitoring? Okay. How do you good question. So we at Shopify we have some monitors working and we also, every single new version of the framework we do is always rollout. So 
we put the new version only a small subset of servers and we measure the performance difference between them. And if anything is, any of the graphs are higher because of the new version, we usually use some profiling tools like strike proof to see what's the difference in the code path, like what methods have been called now that was not being called before, and we get that report, we revert the change back in the servers, and we get the report and we try to fix the bug. So I, I kind of want to answer a subset of that question. Um, just the like, how do you deal with a performance problem if it like only happens in production? Um, so most of the time I'm able to um, isolate it a little bit, like say, okay, this endpoint is slow, like this one specific endpoint is slow. And then if I can't reproduce it locally, like, well, well, what is different between my server and, and locally? Um, like one big one is data, right? Like if you, if you don't have data locally, that is, you might be doing like a select star and without a limit, and if you only have five elements in your database, it'll be really fast. If you've got a million elements, you know, it's, it's like, it's really painful. Um, and so like your database, your Redis, uh, your data stores, and, and then may, it might be the conditions. It might not just be that endpoint uh, with data in your database, it might be that all of those things, but only when one specific user is logged in. And so that's when having like uh, a little bit of logging where if you're using something like paper trail or, or something and you say, oh yes, here, here this one request, like this very specific request is itself slow. I'm going to try and reproduce my local environment as much as to simulate that request as possible. Um, and that's gotten me a really, really long way Granted, you sometimes you spend all of that effort <laughs> and it still can't reproduce it locally, but um, nine times out of 10, like I find some really low hanging fruit that way. If I had a nickel for every time a developer said, it's fast on my machine, <laughs> like that, yeah. So there's a, a ton of different ways to make sure that you're experience, it, experiencing the same things that your users do. The, the big one that most Rails developers and shops don't do is work in development with production-like data. You probably can't do that if you're Shopify or GitHub, but most of us are not Shopify or GitHub. Um, so just making sure that when you know uh, you call user.all, that in development, that might return 10 rows, but in production, it's gonna return 10,000. Um, so just exposing yourself as much as possible to uh, the same conditions that will occur in production um, on front end, this is always uh, network and CPU. We all have really nice MacBook Airs, probably some fat fiber connections at our offices or at home. Um, Chrome DevTools lets you throttle your network connection. There's also, I mean, there's a ton of tools for throttling network connection, but throttling your network connection, slowing down your CPU, Chrome will do that for you, um, and, uh, and making sure you experience your website the same way your users do. Cool. Um, I just wanted to make another comment about like major framework upgrades. Something that both um, Eileen and Rafael do is they're able to run at the same time uh, both an old version of Rails and a new version of Rails. So they have the ability to deploy it into production with the new major framework change, see if it works. If it doesn't work, well, we'll just use the old version for now. Um, and do you, do you think this is something that more, um, I guess, shops should, a practice more shops should follow with major Rails upgrades? Or is this something that is very niche to GitHub and Shopify? Well, one of the problems with GitHub is we're like really far behind. So um, <laughs> we kind of have to do that, like have the multiple versions because it's gonna take too long to do an upgrade to actually get to the point where we can deploy it without having two different versions in the code base most times. Actually, in fact, we theoretically could have more than that. We just don't do that more than two at once. Um, I think that if, if you have a big code base, it makes sense to have multiple Rails versions going just because of the whole, the whole how, how long the upgrade process is gonna take because otherwise you're just gonna constantly be falling behind and, and there's no way you, you don't want to work on a branch like by yourself that you're constantly rebasing because then you're fixing other people's conflicts all the time and then you're going to go like extra crazy, not just Rails upgrade crazy, but you're going to go get rebase crazy. Um, 
And so that's one of the things that we do in uh, at GitHub is we have a conditional that if, and, and this is how I recommend to do it, the version that you're currently on is your if statement, so that's like the special case, and then everything else should fall through. So that way you keep moving the code that's special up to the if case and everything else should fall through, and then you know when it's broken for that new version, and that it's not, like you're not confused about, well, when am I running Rails 4 code, or when am I running Rails 3 code? Like it's always your top conditional and then falls through. Excellent. Rafael? So yeah, I believe that doing this kind of dual booting, as we call, is better to upgrade because it's make it easy to you to deploy to production and find bugs. But also, I think it's a good practice for the entire community to be able to do that early. Like, we always try to release Rails in some kind of good piece, like every six months. But we release release candidates and a lot of different things. Everyone try release candidates usually in small applications, but the real problems only happens when people upgrade the major applications, like when Shopify discuss GitHub or big applications upgrade, because usually they get all the the corner case of the frameworks. So if we, we always do that in all the applications that we always are able to use two different versions of the framework that would be better for the entire community and also for the application. Are there any resources that people can go to figure out how to do this? Because they know now that it can be done, but what, what, what magic do they need to do to make this happen? Yeah, so GitHub has a blog post, a really, really old blog post about that. But I think it's not the GitHub blog, but it's somewhere Someone from the GitHub made that blog post. And I think Shopify also has a blog post uh, two years ago, maybe. And I'm going to release my slides and also a new blog post next week. Excellent. What do you do to stem that? Like stem all that loss? Uh, I'll just, I'll just uh, ask that loud. Um, the question is, what do you do with the gem file and the gem file dot lock file? So so we have a condition, right now what we are doing, we have a monkey patch on bundler inside our gen file because the gen files are Ruby code and we can monkey patch inside the gen file itself. That's not so great, so I try to change that to use a different approach. Like the bundler team told me that there is an option called Evolution file that you can use to share different two different G files, and we are going to use that in your next project. So we have two lock files, but only one G file right now. Yeah, we, we have two lock files, but our regular gem file has a conditional in it. So if the if if it's GitHub Rails four or whatever, like it'll load the gems for that, and then otherwise it loads the three two. Gems. Do you just tell Bundler like which gem file that locks to? No, so when we we haven't yeah some uh, you, you we have, have an environment to ha you variable. Ha you hack bun Bundler basically. Okay. Yeah. Well, everything has works. to run with a with an environment var and variable in front of it. So we do Rails four equals one, and then it knows which gem file lock to load. So it loads the four. But I don't I don't know if we hacked Bundler because I I wasn't there for that. So. <laughs> Um, I think we're running very, very low on time. I think we're already five minutes over. over. Yeah. So um, I'm just, we're, we're still here. You can come ask us questions. But yeah, um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, panel.